So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last one in this series of what is the big issue, this, these autumn talks. Um, we welcome Eve, and I'll comment on her in a minute. But first of all, can we pray, listen to Augustine prayer that I've said every week. So a prayer before we begin. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. So lead us by your spirit, that in this life we may live to your glory, and in the life to come, enjoy you forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so today we welcome Dr. Eve Parker, who is a lecturer in modern theology at Manchester University, and was elected to Trafford Council for the first time in May 2023. So experiences both in theology and politics. Her publications include Trust in Theological Education and Theologizing with the Sacred Prostitutes of South India, and I'm sure much more. Eve, you're very welcome. Over to you for what you're going to tell us. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, so I want to start today with the words of the Irish suffragette, Charlotte Despard, who said, I've always believed in discontent, not grumbling, which is usually selfish and individual, but a disinclination to sit idly, knowing things are wrong. I think it's fair to say that today in Britain, many things are wrong. The struggle for economic and social justice continues. Income inequality persists. Housing injustice, high rents, exploitative landlords have all become norms in our society. I think a symptom of decay in our modern period is the continued need for food banks and warm banks. It's the fact that children from low income households are significantly more likely to suffer from mental health issues because a low income means facing constant insecurity and uncertainty. We know that the poorest within our society are more likely to have no housing or inadequate housing, poor mental health, low educational attainment, unemployment, loneliness, and low social mobility. We also know that such struggles are too often met with a culture of impunity and disregard. But these social realities are not accidental. They are the result of political decisions of ideologies that have determined that some people are of more worth than others. So what does this have to do with Christianity? Well, to answer this, we must ask whether one sees their faith as something that pushes them towards working for a better world, whether Christianity challenges us to take ethical responsibility, especially if, as Bonhoeffer contended, the church has an unconditional obligation towards the victims of any societal order, not just to bind up the wounds of the victim beneath the wheel of injustice, but to seize the wheel itself. For Bonhoeffer, the hungry person needs bread, the homeless person needs shelter, the one deprived of rights needs justice, the lonely person needs community, and the slave needs freedom. He argued that it would be blasphemy against God and our neighbor to leave the hungry unfed while saying that God is closest to those deepest in need. But there is a further question though at the heart of this message, and that is what the Christian chooses to witness. Do we see those who struggle within our societies? And if we see them, do we love them? Because how can we have a love for humanity whilst upholding systems that oppress? And I ask this because right now, governments around the world are failing to act on grave inequalities. Profit is persistently put before people and land. And I don't think that anyone with any sort of insight can honestly look into the world around us today and fail to see that something is radically wrong. So how then does this relate to Christians and politics? 
The Christian God is revealed through God's actions in the history of community. Consequently, Christianity has always been intertwined with politics. Making sense of the biblical world of Jesus involves an understanding of the political forces that were at play in the ancient world and situating Jesus's message within the context of Roman rule, where he lived on the margins of the empire in Galilee and was vocal in speaking out on the impending destruction of the political order and on the social and economic inequalities that shaped society. But there's also a very toxic combination of Christianity and politics, particularly when the root cause of such a combination is the desire for greater power and control. After all, Christianity has been the religion of empires, from Rome to Portugal, France, Spain, Germany, the Netherlands and Britain, and so on. The military forces of the European colonial powers of history expanded their empires, and they were accompanied with their weapons and their missionaries and the Christian faith. The imperial demand to acquire wealth often went hand in hand with the so-called saving of the souls of the heathen native, even by sword when deemed necessary. Therefore, we cannot overlook the fact that when considering the role of Christians and politics, we have to think about how this is played out in history, where colonial capitalism that was rooted in notions of white Christian supremacy involved the enslavement of over 12 million African people over a 350 year period. That's human beings being kidnapped, stolen from their countries, robbed of their agency and their rights, tortured, sold, exploited, and often murdered. And the role of the Christian missionaries was in the words of one statement issued by the London Missionary Society, not to relieve them from their servile condition, but to afford them the consultation of religion. Slavery was a political choice. The demand for slave labor served the interests of the British state, as the political ideology that governed Britain stressed the individual's right to pursue economic freedoms and interests. Such interests included slavery. And the politics that spoke to the freedom of trade encouraged imperial expansion, but denied the freedoms of those they enslaved and dehumanized. In the process, they did, and then what they did, they did this under the premise that the non-Christian, so-called heathen, was not entitled to such freedoms. Such political ideology that was rooted in an imperial notion of Christian morality enabled some of the worst brutalities of British imperialism. And whilst Christian missionaries went out to convert the enslaved, many slave owners in the colonies initially resisted these evangelistic efforts, partially out of concern that if enslaved people became Christians, they would see themselves as their owners equals and then demand their freedoms and rights. And so the slaves who worked on the plantation fields of the Caribbean were sometimes given what was called a slave Bible, where the verses that taught on freedom, justice and liberation were removed, including the books of Exodus and Jeremiah. And instead, Obedience to the master was the Christian message that was professed. As Alan Bosak states when talking of colonial missions in the context of South Africa, it was made clear to us that for this salvation to occur, we had to follow their way of believing, accept their way of interpreting the scripture, their ideas of gods, their understandings of Jesus, their ways of working of the Holy Spirit. The God of Christianity has been used in the arena of global politics to justify some of the most heinous crimes of history, including, for example, the political apartheid regime of South Africa, where the apartheid was described as a gift of God himself. The Dutch Reformed Church was central 
in advocating for the political apartheid regime. The famous Afrikaans poet Totius stood before the People's Congress in 1944 and stated, God is a great divider. He argued that the barbarity of Black Africa was ascribed to the curse of Ham, and he used the Bible to justify a political system of racial segregation and argued that such division was divinely justified. Such atrocities brought about by the combination of interpretations of Christianity and politics go beyond the Christianity of empires. Because we can't forget that the Christian politics of the Ku Klux Klan in America that led to the Jim Crow laws and the segregation of black people was also done in the name of Christ. Politics and Christianity were intertwined with the Klan even wearing white robes to symbolize purity, burning crosses to signify the light of Christ and picking selective scriptures from the Bible to preach white supremacy. Their political messaging taught that only good Christian white people who believe in racial purity and Protestant morality would save the country from destruction. I also don't want to overlook the role that Christianity's played in the politics of suppressing the working class in Britain. Now, I speak today from Manchester, where in 1819, the Peterloo massacre took place where a crowd of men, women, and children gathered peacefully in the name of reform, universal suffrage, better working conditions, and equal representation. In response, two Anglican clerics, who were prominent among the magistrates, joined in ordering the cavalry charge on this peaceful demonstration. An estimated 18 people died, including women and children, from the sword wounds and trampling. Nearly 700 men, women, and children received serious injuries. And then these same Anglican clerics used the courts to punish the victims. And at the root of such acts was political disdain for the struggles of the working class, committed by men of the cloth who were in positions of great power. Now, of course, these are just some examples of how Christianity, politics, and power have been intertwined in history. But there is another side to the subject of Christians and politics, the side where the oppressed become conscious of their oppression and politics becomes the politics of the people and where the Christian message of justice, love, and solidarity is able to bring about political transformation. The history of Christianity and politics in the context of the global struggles of the oppressed reveals the promise of political transformation. Instead, though, it starts in context of struggle. Because in the midst of those narratives I just described that involve racism, slavery, and violence, there were also Christians living out a very different politic, grounded in the very same scriptures that had been used to oppress them. And this was apparent, for example, in the lives and works of the great Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was born into slavery around 1820 on a plantation in Maryland in the USA. She escaped, she was an escaped enslaved woman who became a conductor on what was known as the Underground Railroad. This was a railroad that was set up to help enslaved people escape to freedom. Tubman was also a nurse and a woman suffrage supporter and a Christian. And it was her faith that inspired her politics and demand for freedom. Tubman was known by many as Moses because she famously used music to communicate with those who were escaping from slavery on this secret underground railroad. The songs known as spirituals would come directly from the biblical stories of liberation, but would be used to carry these secret messages. Take, for example, the song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Coming Forth to Carry Me Home, often used today by the English rugby team, but born out of the slave resistance movements. This song was sang by Tubman 
they would sing them on the plantation fields. And the slave master was assumed that it was simply worship music. But if a slave heard this song in the South, they knew it was time to prepare to escape. The band of angels in the song refers to the conductors of the Underground Railroad, which was known as Sweet Chariot, who would come south. This was the swing low to guide the slave north to freedom, carry me home. Here was a practical Christian political theology of resistance that would go on to influence the political abolitionist movement. Let's also go back to Jamaica, to the plantation fields, where the slave owners were seeking to prevent the Christianization of the enslaved peoples. Yet Christianity would go on to inspire the very people the colonialists sought to oppress. Amongst them was a slave named Samuel Sharp, a Christian leader on the plantations who went on to help bring about a slave rebellion in 1831 also known as the Baptist War, an event that was largely instrumental in help bringing about the abolition of slavery. Sharp held religious meetings that were, only, that were the only permissible forms of organized activity. Here he outlined his anti-slavery politics, and he did so in the context of scripture, and he encouraged political consciousness amongst the enslaved. He called for passive resistance by which the slaves would refuse to work on Christmas day and afterwards, unless their grievances were met. Sam explained his plan to his chosen supporters after his religious meetings, and he made them kiss the Bible to show their loyalty. In turn, they would go about and tell the other slaves not to work on Christmas day. But word of the plan reached the ears of some of the plantation owners and they sent in their troops to Jamaica to squash the rebellion. On the 27th of December, 1831, the Kensington State Estate Great House was set on fire as a signal that the slave rebellion had begun. A terrible retribution followed and more than 500 slaves lost their lives, most of them as a result of the trials that happened afterwards. Amongst them was Sam Sharp, who was hung to death on May the 23rd, 1832. But his call for political change and his use of Christianity in bringing about political consciousness, helped to bring about the 1834 Abolition Bill, which was passed by British Parliament in 1838. Slavery was abolished. Sam Sharp, the Bible, had a central place to play in the history of change in Jamaica. When he was on trial, Sam Sharp himself said, he used the Bible to explain why he brought about this rebellion. He, when he, he said, when he was asked, for example, what was the basis, he responded by appealing to the authority of the Bible. He said, no man can serve two masters, Matthew 6, verse 24. And he said, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be de free indeed, John 8, 36. <laughs> now let's return briefly to the context of North America where the KKK was professing their political Christianity of white supremacy and racial segregation that was legitimized through scripture, whilst black people were being denied of their basic rights, also in the name of Christ. At the same time, there was another Christian politics that was born, though this was a politics rooted in the Christianity of black struggle a Christian politics that was at the heart of the civil rights movement in the USA. In 1963, Martin Luther King Jr., a Baptist minister, helped to organize a march on Washington, an assembly of more than 200,000 people, where he made his famous I Have a Dream speech. The march went on to influence the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but in speaking against racism and discrimination, King used both political and Christian discourse, directly quoting from the book of Isaiah, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Finally, I want us to return to the context of the working class in Britain 
because this too is a history in which Christianity and politics have been intertwined. In 1912, Keir Hardy, the founder of the Independent Labour Party, called out the injustices of the socio-political system that had caused grave inequalities. Speaking to a group of miners on strike, he said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who died to save your souls, how long do you intend to submit to a system which is defacing God's image upon you? At the time when Hardy spoke these words, many of the working class in Britain were living in dire poverty. And many of the workers who were on strike fighting for fair pay and better working conditions were also dealing with the realities of hunger, as well as the societal shame and stigma that the elites of late Victorian England thought to impose on the strikers and their families, the so-called deserving poor. This of course is not too dissimilar from today when we read the recent attack lines accusing striking nurses of destroying the NHS, teachers of making sure kids suffer, and bus drivers who on strike for being feckless, according to the Daily Mail. In blaming the workers, they seek to divide the workers, and in the process, deny culpability in years of underfunding vital public services and failure to provide safe working conditions and fair pay. It's not in the interest of those who seek to maintain a system of inequality to permit the working class to have agency or consciousness in class inequality. But Keir Hardy, Harriet Tubman, Sam Sharp, Martin Luther King Jr. reveal histories of Christians and politics that are too often overlooked. Histories that are too often not taught about in our education systems. Histories that show a people not content with the wrongs of society. A history not of kings and queens, but of ordinary working people willing to rise up and demand change. And at the root is a Christian message of love, solidarity and resistance. The issue then with Christianity and politics is an issue of situatedness and hermeneutics. In other words, the lens through which we interpret Christianity. At times it can become about whether the Christian chooses to see God as the great divider or see God as the creator who takes the side of the oppressed. And then deciding if as Christians we're willing to join those who live in the struggle at the foot of the cross in hopelessness searching for justice. To be political in our Christian faith involves a process of conscientiousization, where we choose to take part in humanizing the world through collective struggle and praxis. This requires of the Christian the need to go beyond charity in response to the injustices around us and to be political, to question and challenge the policies and structures that have led to increasing levels of poverty, child deprivation, housing inequality, violence against women, an underfunded national health service, a cost of living crisis, inadequate funding for mental health services, the list goes on. Because in agreement with Jürgen Moltmann, we have no right to speak of God and with God if we do not do it in the midst of the conflicts of our political world. Because how often we hear our church leaders <laughs> and theologians talk of theology of a love for the poor, taking the side of the poor, walking with the marginalized. But what does it mean to do a theology of or from the margins if it is not political, if it is not taking a stance on the lack of workers' rights, the prejudices against the poor, the murdering of innocent children, men and women, who attempt to challenge systems that oppress? What good is theology that profess professes a love for the poor if it isn't disgusted at the fact that the richest 1% grab nearly two thirds of all new wealth during the pandemic whilst the poorer became poorer? What good is a theology of love if it is not turning over the tables of the elites, helping unionize the workers, and demanding political change to bring an end to the climate crisis that disproportionately impacts the global working class the hardest. When we talk of theologies of the marginalized, we're talking about the struggle of God's people and the search for hope in the midst of such struggle. 
According to Anna Maria Ferrari, hope is revolutionary transformed either through knowledge or through radical ethics, but it loses strength, brilliance, and political clarity without fraternal love. Such love involves a political solidarity where the Christian is willing to join in the struggle of those who are oppressed and join God in God's struggle for justice and dignity, for the humanization of the world. It's about embracing the restlessness that longs for a different world, a new humanity recreated tomorrow. This is important because as we look at the interconnected struggles of those who fight for survival, we must recognize also that the battle is not lost. As with the God who created the word made flesh, there is resistance, resilience, and the power of that same word who was crucified, but did he too not rise up? In the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, it is written that life conquered death, that redemption from even the most painful of human destructiveness is not only possible, but it is promised. And I don't mean to tread down a path of blissful triumphalism theology that says, don't worry about the struggles of the day because the hope is in the kingdom to come. Instead, it's about acknowledging the need to address the social and political realities around us, to think for oneself, to think out what is true and what is right. And when God is not considered a great divider, but instead the liberator of the oppressed, the Christian then can become rooted in a politics that stake, takes the side of those who struggle. This is echoed in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who during the rule of the Third Reich in Germany reminded the church that only those who cry out for the Jews may sing the Gregorian chant. Being politically conscious of those who struggle in our societies and choosing to take political action in the midst of such struggle is deeply rooted in a theology of the cross of Christ, as it is here that we become the community of the crucified God and are called to join in the struggles of those who suffer. I'll end there. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, we have got a time for comments or for questions. Would you like to raise a hand or um, either physically or touch the yellow hand that you've got on your screen, do please uh, ask the question or a comment for Eve. I apologize in advance or too belatedly if I was too political. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Anybody like to comment or say anything? It looks like Jane. Yes, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much. I, I, I can't disagree with anything that you said. I mean, it was all <laughs> very, very fantastic. It's very difficult um, sometimes in the church. I mean, it's my turn to do the intercessions on Sunday. How do I pray about Israel and Palestine and Gaza and when there are so many complications there? What I mean, apart from loving everybody, and um, it, it's really you know, treading a minefield sometimes. And I, yes, I don't believe you can be a Christian without being pol political. And, and I was a union rep for 15 years, you know, and I'm very used to sticking up for the, the people who can't stick up for themselves. I do believe, though, that we shouldn't be talking about sides because mm. I think, you know, God loves everybody. Mm. And I remember talking to um, the Wirral, Wirral Conservative Ladies Luncheon Club once about what life is like in post-Soviet Russia. And um, they were the best audience of any of the talks I gave. And they were just opening their purses, opening their handbags. The money I took, you know, in donations, yeah. they were so generous and so such a willing, warm, receptive audience. There were actual blue rinses. I'd never seen anybody with a real blue rinse before. We had a wonderful lunch, you know. Everybody fell asleep while I was talking. But, <laughs> you know, we shouldn't be talking about the rich and the poor we, we should be saying we're all one humanity and i know when um when we had the brexit vote talking to my hairdresser about you know the fact that we're all in it together you know with, mm -hmm. as far as i was concerned we we all 
part of, you know, suffering from global warming. We're all suffering from militant, you know, terrorism. And and, and I think it's, it's sometimes a bit misleading to talk about God being on somebody's side because he's on everybody's side. But thank you. It's very, very insightful. I think that's a really key point as well. Sometimes the conversations can become so polarized and, and that becomes so problematic. And I think Bonhoeffer is really helpful here in, in the ways in which he struggled, addressed the fact that sometimes Christians can't or shouldn't um, do exactly what you just said, like jump into something by automatically taking sides and overlooking the complexities of the politics at play. And I think, as you talked about your intercessions, that's so difficult, isn't it, to do, especially with the intercessions at the moment. Um, so I don't envy that job at all. Um, but yeah, it's a and the, the concept of the poor and the oppressed comes obviously from the readings of scripture where the poor speaks not necessarily just to the financial poor, but those who struggle within society and are so often overlooked, um, which can be in various different societies, depending upon what context of oppression that is that you're looking at. So it's more of a generalized term. Um, but I you're completely, very... I completely agree with you about um, all being one humanity and that love being for that all. I was very, very moved by Corrie Ten Boom's, the part of her story, where she actually set up a home for uh, the uh, concentration camp guards after the war, because she recognized that they were suffering too. Mm -hmm. You know, that they would be traumatised, and, and I mean, a lot of them would be traumatised by what they took part in them, themselves. <laughs> that must have been an incredibly brave thing to do. Incredibly brave. To actually think about their needs as well as the obvious needs of the victims. Absolutely. Thank you. Lynn, you've got your hand up. Uh, thanks. Um, I just want to say thank you very much um, on that, Eve. It's, um, it's a difficult subject. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I could probably go on and on, uh, probably <laughs> probably shut up. I probably wouldn't shut up. <laughs> um, so I'd just like to say thank you very much. It is a very difficult subject to bring politics and Christianity together. Um, it's probably very sensitive and would be in a lot of uh, congregations mm. uh, to bring it um, into sessions as well. Um, and I don't think people do realise um, the connection uh, of Christianity and politics. I think they, they understand that um, how, how people are, the vulnerable, um, but I don't think they, they quite connect with the politics side of it as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. It's a it is a difficult subject to bring up, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. It's so thank true, you. isn't it? As well, it's the one conversation that they say don't bring up at the dinner table. <laughs> Just so happens to be all I talk about. <laughs> Nick, have you got a question? <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> finally on mute myself. Uh, no, it's good to hear the talking about politics. I know in my church, or people have put on Facebook that Christians shouldn't be political. But, and uh, I strongly disagree, and I almost feel like saying a swear word to them. But, uh, of course, uh, I keep quiet about that, and I keep it to myself. I can understand that you shouldn't be party political because that could be divisive and keep it to yourself who you vote for. But uh, we should be there for the poor and exploited, I feel, as Christians. And we should do it from that angle, from the angle the Bible takes rather than being party political. So, uh, yeah, I agreed with your talk. Well, thank you so much, Nick. I think it's really interesting as well, because that whole discomfort in talking about politics in religious context has been there for such a long time, particularly in Britain. In other parts of the world, it's so normalised to talk politics, especially lots of my research has been in Latin America, where obviously politics and uh, theology are very intertwined. But in I've been doing a lot of research recently 
about British working class history. And, um, and it's fascinating to see, particularly in the early in the, in the late Victorian period, the role that the church played in educating working class children and how it didn't necessarily name that as politics, but they set up these special Sunday schools for kids that couldn't afford um, an education or working um, in the mills. And so the only access to an education was through these special Sunday schools that were put on, which also talk, taught political consciousness, for example. And it was set up at the time to help children whose parents were like working on the docks. And so this idea that the churches were very much rooted in politics, they just didn't name it as such, but it was obviously very political because it was education for political consciousness and the power of an education for the working class. So um, yeah, it was just a fascinating bit of history that we often overlook. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before we finish? We've got time for one more if anyone has one that they'd like to say or comment on. So that leaves me to say thank you so much for finishing this series with such a wonderful presentation and talk. It's um, very stimulating and wonderful to hear one or two people I kind of knew about but wasn't quite sure about. And I, I love to hear Harriet Tubman celebrated as well. You often don't hear her celebrated in, in speech, speeches of any kind. So thank you so much. Um, so this is the last one of the series, everyone. You will be told about the one in the flesh, so to speak, in the spring term that Paul Middleton will be organising. And they're during Lent. So it'll be the first Wednesday in Lent that that will start. But you'll hear about it then. So George and I disappear to Sheffield, but I'm sure we'll be online at some stage to meet you. But thank you, Eve, so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this series, especially those who have been every single week. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye.